like to hear the papa cheers and play the characters that you cheer. So join us as we go, 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 below the frame. On the season finale of Below the Frame, I'm talking to legendary Muppet performer Dave Goals. We talk about how he snuck into CBS as a teenager, his job at Hewlett Packard, and, well, Jim Henson and the Muppets, of course. We'll also hear a story and a song by Jerry Nelson. So what are you waiting for? It's time to go Below the Frame. Let's do it. Go, go, go Below the Frame. Welcome to Below the Frame with me, Matt Vogel. Here we are. It's the season two finale, and what better way to end this season of interviews and fake ads and injury corners and Jerry stories and songs than with one of the longtime Muppet performers, Dave Goals. If you are a Muppet fan, which I'm assuming you are, you definitely know who Dave Goals is, but have you ever gotten to sit in a room with him for a couple of hours and just let him talk? Maybe you have. I don't. I have no idea what you do, but uh, I think that most of us would say no. But I sure would like to. And if that is you, then you are in luck because that is what happens today on Below the Frame. We don't go into a, a huge amount of detail on the characters that he plays or even the great memorable projects that that much. Really, we don't. I mean, we do do that, of course. But this is really more of just a chat with uh, Dave. So uh, with that, I am ready to dive into the season finale. Are you? Good. Then let's do it. Let's go below the frame with Dave Goals. Dave Goals, welcome to Below the Frame. <laughs> How are you? Oh, it's a pleasure to meet a professional <laughs> podcast host. Yes. Look well, I'm telling you, you know, one day everybody will have a podcast. No, I'm not going to have a podcast. You were, you're going to. You'll see. You're going to no, have one. I'm not going to have a podcast because everybody I don't believe it. that everybody in the world has something worthwhile to share, including me. Well, when then now that is not true. And I will tell you that this people love hearing the stories of the Muppet performers and where they came from and how they got to where they are. And, and I'm sure you feel like, because you've lived it, you've told it a million times. But, you know, not everybody hears everything that that you say i know that might be hard to to believe most people don't pay attention that's why that's probably true i'm wondering why we're here why are we doing this well because i have probably seven listeners and they are very eagerly (laughs) awaiting uh me talking to you i think wow well i'll tell you this about my life i have had an epic life i am still having an epic life yeah it is grand in its scale but I have to say that everybody has an epic life. Every single person and being on the planet has an epic life. Look at, we all got born. We were yep. born. We were hatched or born. Yep. Everything on the planet that is alive it was hatched or born. That in itself is epic. Yeah. Somehow this happened that, that two biological entities got together and then you're born. Mm-hmm. You had nothing to do with it. You did not exist before. And suddenly you're here. Right. That in itself is epic. So, so that's but just thing. starting from, from day one, the it's fact epic. that we're here. It's, it's epic. epic. It's a huge thing. Humans are curious and skeptical, I think, probably at the same time. And f- fearful. Very afraid. And fearful. Absolutely. But it does elevate everyone's life to the epic status. Plus, we can walk. <laughs> yes, That's we can. Epic. Yes. We have a language. We can talk. We can communicate. Even before language, we can still go, ugh, ugh, ugh. Give me that, right? That's right? epic. That's yeah. epic. I, That's I, I don't think starfishes can do that. I don't know how they communicate. Yeah, so. They must, though. And if they do communicate in some way, I'm, it's probably pretty cool because we're unaware of what that is and we're pretty smart beings. That's right. Well, uh, smart in technical ways. Scientifically, we're smart. Socially, yes. not mm. much progress. There. <laughs> That's probably true. But um, I, I was once doing a program at a museum, and uh, somebody said, oh, it's so great to, to hear from you. And I said, well, 
Yes, but it would be greater if we could all get up here one at a time and interview each other because I'm sure there would be some incredible stories. I agree with that. We all have moments in our lives that are remarkable and that do stand out in some way if we took the time to really just absorb that and it, it's epic realize. it's epic you know yep. you think oh oh i mean i'm just ordinary i think the same thing i'm just ordinary and i happen to have a, a job that people seven people are interested in but <laughs> but um yeah it's ordinary it's just the life as i live it is the same as anybody else lives it and same as you know brad pitt lives it it's well, yeah, but he has. I same. mean, he has. He has. A, <laughs> he's he's like, got better fixtures in his house, but and still, I guess that's epic too, right? Yeah. But yeah. But it's not as big as being able to walk. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Right? Yeah. If absolutely. You can say, do you want to have a really good kitchen faucet or be able to walk? Which Which do you choose? Would you like walk. language, or do you want to have uh, plumbing in your house? Uh, I have to have the language. You yeah. got to go for the language. That's because it's epic, right? It's epic. It's, you can go to the store and you can say, "Could I, could I have a pound of ground chuck?" And <laughs> without that, you 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 might be able to do? point to it. Yeah. But how would you say one pound? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I, I got off on a tangent. I'm no, it's sorry. fine. Look, you know this is, but this is all related to who you are, Dave. You you live this epic life, and I would like to actually, what I'd like to do is I'd like to hear about. Before you became a Muppet performer, tell me a little bit about where you grew up and about your life as a child. I had a good imagination, and my parents encouraged it. I came from a middle-class household where my dad was a mechanical engineer, and my mom was a housewife and a Cub Scout leader and part of the PTA. I was always very active, and it made me feel really privileged. But it was an ordinary life, really. It was an ordinary life, and... Uh, I had a few proclivities from the age of at least, five, going back at least as far as five, that sort of, in retrospect, led me to show business. <laughs> oh. Like, when I was five, I loved puppets on TV. I just and loved it. What were the loved, puppets that were on TV? At I that watched time? Beanie and Cecil, mm -hmm. Time for Beanie, and I watched uh, Howdy Doody. And I was obsessed with them for, I don't know how long it was, a year or two. Um, and then I moved on to other interests. But it happened again at 12, got interested in puppets again at 12. I was also in high school part of talent programs. We did, we performed a couple of songs as the Beatles in 1963, just after they broke in America. And then I... Uh, with puppets, you performed Beatles? No, no, not with puppets, no, as, at, with wigs. <laughs> Wait, you were, you were singing or you were lip syncing? What were you we were, we were singing. I was playing the drums. And really? we did a couple, a couple of Beatles songs. There were four of us. We bought these cheap wigs and then chopped them into <laughs> Beatle shapes. Yeah. I mean, they, were, they must have been a dollar and a half for the wigs. And we sang a couple of Beatles songs. And we, because we just were so taken with them that we wanted to, to, uh, to try being them for a bit. Yeah. So yeah. we did that. And then the next year, I wrote and uh, starred in a JFK press conference at the talent show. <laughs> and, you know, there was a, a record album at the time, a couple of albums by Vaughn Meter, who yeah. did a Kennedy impression, and he had other actors do the brothers. Mm -hmm. And it was hysterically funny, and it just, it, you know, this was the time of Camelot. It was the time when we believed in our leader. Um, there was a great deal of excitement about Kennedy, and... So when the album came out, I was absolutely in love with it. And Kennedy, I think, probably enjoyed it, too, because of a great yeah. sense of humor. Um, and so we did a press conference. And I, I remember one joke that I wrote for it, okay. which was, uh, he said, uh, the question from the... And we had a bunch of news people in our press conference sketch. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was me and, and Teddy and, um, and Bobby. And I had two friends playing those parts. So one joke was, uh, well, so they say that the Kennedy family is a political dynasty. And he says, well, I don't know about that, but uh, I would say this. Uh, uh, y you know, I, I expect to serve until 1968, and then my brother Bobby will take over, and uh, he will be elected for two terms. So that will bring Teddy's turn around, and he will be, uh, uh, he will also serve two terms, and by then it'll be 1984, <laughs> which is actually, the math is correct. 
Yeah, that's a reference to a book. It's, the, it's reference to the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if you've heard of the book. You don't. Yeah. Know, you know the book, Ben? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's a it's a dystopian future. Oh, okay. So you're just explaining that for any any of the listeners yes, who might not know, know how to know, read. Yes, for those who don't know, 1984 is a dystopian future. That's very. Uh, that's really. Big kind. brother, Big Brother is watching over. It's very sweet of all you, Matt. Of us. Yeah, you're looking no. after. You're making sure that everybody is is aware of what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask me if I've read the book, Dave. Have you read the book? No. <laughs> I don't think so. If I did, it would have been. I mean, I would. I would have. It would have been in high school, I guess. I, I read the book, and it was a good thing because now I can recognize what's happening. <laughs> you can see the realities of it. Yes, that's a pretty good Jack Kennedy impersonation, even still. Pretty yeah, good. it's probably a lower pitch than it used to be. It's yeah, nice. Well, thanks. That's nice of you. Uh, you knew that Von Meter album? Oh, I, I've forgotten how many albums there were, but I had all of them. Yeah, there was one in particular that started this off. I loved it. I knew the album, but we didn't do material from the album. We had our own material. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, Jerry, I'm sure you know this, but Jerry was friends with Von Meter. I know. He that's was. so crazy. Well, that's one of those things. friends spending time with him, and you were, you know, emulating Von Meter by, by writing your own bits. Absolutely. I was copying what he did. I, listen, this whole thing is, it's on the subject of loopbacks. And, and I mm. always think, if I could have known then what was going to happen now, you know, I have found myself staying in apartments for work now, you know, in the last 10 years that are across the street from where I used to go buy my clothes when I was a kid. My dad and I would go and I'd get a shirt or a pair of shoes or a suit. But, you know, if somebody had stopped me on the street and said, excuse me, I'm from the future, guess what? (laughs) It's going to be apartments over there and you're going to live here when you're whatever age, 60 or something. I would have said... Oh, get out of here. Come on. How do you, you can't even know that. So, but it would be nice if people would come along and tell us these things. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Most of it. As long as it's good stuff. Want, yeah, you don't want, want good stuff. You do not want bad news. <laughs> right, right. Did something like that happen when we shot the ABC Muppets? Was it the house that uh, Pepe and Gonzo lived in? There was a real house. Does that make oh, sense? Oh, that? oh, oh. Did we shoot on location there? We in, shot on location, yeah. Yes, that, 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 like that house was occupied by. A friend of mine in high school named Linda Scholl. It's so crazy. That was Linda's house. I didn't know her well enough to ever go there then, but, you know, obviously I was all over the thing later on. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's just so was, weird that you knew who lived in that house. I know, and I had no idea they had such a spectacular house. Yeah. Oh, there was a tree inside the house, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a tree inside the house, and there was a pool in the back, and a yeah. separate studio out there where you could go down and look through a window into the pool. That's right. I had no idea that, that my friend was involved in stuff like that. When you were a kid, you, you kind of talked about how you, you were interested in puppets and you kind of did theatrical things. You did some your Beatles stuff and the JFK uh, impersonation. You also did some stuff. Uh, you, would, you, would, you and a friend would sneak into CBS, wasn't it? We snuck into CBS most successfully, but also NBC. We could not get into ABC, and we couldn't get into the film studios. When was was this? This was in high school. This was the first two years of high school. My my dear friend, who is still my dear friend, Mark Waxman, who you've met. Yep. But you probably don't remember because you're an insincere, uh, insincere Hollywood type. Hey, wait, no, he was wait, on the what? what? Didn't he come to the roof? We were shooting on the roof with Gordon oh, Ramsay. Or, no, no. Oh, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. that's right. That's on the roof of a parking lot behind yeah. Robinson's in L.A. Yes, we did. Right? He did come in. Yeah, you, re- okay. you do remember. Him. Okay, thank you. Phew. So Mark and I used to sneak into TV studios, and we had a variety of techniques, and we had four ways into CBS. That's where we went the most. <laughs> they had they had great shows too. They had Carol Burnett. We 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 nailed Carol Burnett's show a few times. We went to Red Skelton's show. We we there was internal security, so we could not get into um, um, Liza Minnelli's mother's show. Mm. Uh, I can't Did even you? say the name because of the security. But oh, really? Yeah, that that show was had internal Don't security. Talk. We couldn't get into that one. But we we saw a lot of stuff, and and uh, it was our hobby for two years, like tenth and eleventh grade. Just after school, you would just go, hey, let's go hit up CBS, let's go. And would you just sneak in? And- we do it on Friday and Saturday evenings, and that's when they, uh, they, that's when they did the dress rehearsals and the actual shoots of the shows. Those shows were shot before a studio audience, and we would sneak in 
via another route and then blend in with the audience and just sit in the audience. And at one time, we blended in, went right past an usher, sat down, and we were in front of the usher. He called another usher over and he said, listen, um, Pete, just keep your eyes open because some people like to sneak into these shows. So just you know, really watch the uh, door carefully. We're sitting there right in front of him. <laughs> right in front of him. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you another great experience from that. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the Carol Burnett shows had Tony Bennett as a guest. <clears throat> and Tony did the sweetest thing that I've ever seen. We were backstage. We were There was a central corridor in Television City where we would arrive, and then we would go through the big elephant door into the different stages where we were sneaking into. But by the elephant door, Tony Bennett was singing songs with a bass and drums just because he was a nice guy. He was just standing there singing for the crew. Wow. And people were standing around listening. We all appreciated it because he was so sweet to just do this. And I was standing like three feet from Tony Bennett while he sang I Left My Heart in San Francisco. And, you know, previously, of course, I'd only seen him on television yeah. in our living room in Burbank. That's why life is epic. It is, but the thing that blows my mind, Dave, is that some years later, you worked with Carol Burnett. You worked with Liza Minnelli. You worked with Tony Bennett. You worked with all of these people that you saw as a high school student. A sneaker. Yeah, yeah. as a sneaker. You, you worked with them later. Like everybody that you've mentioned, you've worked with in your, in your career. That's insane. Yes. yes. But it wasn't all fun. You were drafted into the Army. Weren't you? No. Were you, but I know you went to the Army. Did you go I was, to the Army? I was in there because I uh, had graduated. I didn't have my deferment anymore, so I decided I would take the path of least resistance, which at the time seemed to be joining the reserves. And I, I did not want to be a part of Vietnam. I didn't want to participate in that. It, just, it didn't seem like my life at all. <laughs> and one of the other options would be to run away to Canada which just felt, you know, there were so many unknowns with that that I didn't do it. So um, I, I joined up. <laughs> I went around looking. I went around looking for units with a friend of mine. And, of course, it was hard to get into a reserve unit at that time because everybody wanted in. And uh, my friend and I went to several places, and we couldn't get in. And finally, uh, we found one that would take us. And then he got a medical deferment or something, and he didn't join. <laughs> no. And I remember taking my oath for the Army Reserves on a, on, a, on a base that was perched above the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And it was, I just felt, so, this was so alien to me. Why am I, why do I have my hand up and why am I saying I will? Mm. And my, my dad was standing nearby watching. He was, he came down there that day and... It just must have been, it must have been absolutely, must have been so terrifying for him. How realistic would it have been that you could have been sent to Vietnam? It was happening. Reserve units and Army uh, National Guard units were being activated every now and then and sent straight over to Nam. And let me tell you the bigger story, and then I'll tell you some funny stories. Yeah. Okay, the bigger story was that I signed up for a six-year term, and everybody around me said, well, if we get activated, I'm not going. Like, nobody wanted to be a part of Vietnam, just on moral grounds. And I felt the same way, but I started thinking, well, if, if that happens, there's going to be enormous pressure on us to go, and if we don't go, we'll wind up, you know, in a, in a prison. And I and I it bothered me, and I thought I really want to take care of it now. I don't feel that I, you know. I, so I went to a resistance lawyer, and I told him my story, and he said, "Well, it sounds to me like you're a conscientious objector." I said, "Oh no, no, no I'm not religious at all. I, 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 I wouldn't be a CEO." And he said, "Well, you should go read about the Welch versus the U.S. Uh, here's a bookstore you can get that case. It's a, it's a Supreme Court case that was." decided just like six months before. And um, the essence was that it said, if, you are, um, if your personal moral code takes the place of religious beliefs in your life, then it is equivalent. 
I read that and I read some other things that he recommended that I buy. And the more I read it, the more I thought, this is how I really feel. I mean, if I seriously look at this, I don't want to be a part of killing. I don't want to be a part of war. I don't want my life to be about that. I wasn't raised uh, for, for that. And I, I would hope that I can do something more useful in another way. So that led me to deciding to become a, a conscientious objector. And there was a whole procedure for that that uh, took 11 months and four days to be interviewed by five, five officers, to have the whole file be sent to the uh, army in Fort Benjamin Harris, and then to wait a long time for the answer. So the whole thing was a huge learning experience. And at that time, I thought, gee, I wonder if I'm just being a chicken or lazy. And I thought at the time, well, I don't think I'm lazy. I'm a hardworking guy. And I look back on it now. I wondered, what will you think when you're older? And now that I'm older, I'm really happy that I did it. Because human beings get up to some awful mischief. You know, yes, some do. dreadful... Human beings do the most dreadful things to each other yeah. of any species on the planet. It's you just, didn't want to be. You didn't want to be a part of that. I just didn't want... I just didn't... I just felt like... I didn't want that to be my life. You know, everybody has a teensy little part to play in the world, and I'd rather play something on the positive side of the line. So that's what I, why I did it, and I still feel really happy that I did. Then you made the right decision. Yeah, you know? I just was, you know, I, I mean, I just think human beings fail socially. They just fail yeah. so often. There's a lot of wonderful stuff, of course, but but by and large, why are we still fighting over territory on this little garden that we inhabit. Why are we, why are we doing this? The interesting thing about my unit was that it was psychological operations, which is basically means propaganda. Our, jo our job was to create propaganda. We never actually created any. Um, we never, I never did any work in my, my reserve unit at all, except one time I mopped a floor with water <laughs> in, a, in a single office. Otherwise, they were not organized enough to actually have us do anything. You did have, there was somebody in charge though, right? There was somebody, I know you've talked about Randall. Was his name Randall? Well, now, yeah, you're jumping ahead to my basic training. Uh, there are so many funny things to talk about that okay. I don't even know, I don't even know where to begin. So I don't I'll go either. with you. I'll yeah, yeah. With you. I, I just remember you talking about this guy in particular. Yeah. Well, and, and I have to say, I was scared of basic training. I didn't know what to expect. I just heard that they, they didn't treat you nicely. So we were in a warehouse. Well, we, we, again, the disorganization was just, epic. Just, yeah. We were reported for duty. Like I, I think I flew to SeaTac Airport and then I took a bus down to, the, down to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. And the bus let me off in front of this little bungalow, which was where you're supposed to report. And so we wait around for two or three hours, and they finally said, okay, you guys are going to go to this place. So bus takes us over to that place, and we now it's a barracks, and we set our stuff out in our bunks and made our bunks, and now we had a home. So <laughs> that was the same night. But it took two weeks before we got, actually got to start basic training because they put us in one platoon, and our drill sergeant, who was very strict, his name was Brown, and... Uh, he was very, very serious and strict, and he would come by, and we had to wait about a week, so he would come by and, you know, say hello to us, right. and uh, and then he got transferred to somewhere else, and so he came by and said, I got, I've been transferred, but your news drill sergeant will be Randall Hines. He will come, be, he will be reporting here this afternoon, and uh, but first you have to go get your uniforms, and, and he said, but what I want to say to you before I go is, so long, mothers. <laughs> so he left. Sergeant Brown left, and we went to get our uniforms, and we were standing in this big warehouse, and we were just wearing underpants, right? Our own underpants. Mm -hmm. And we're going through the warehouse, picking up one thing at a time, and long lines snaking through this warehouse, standing there, bare feet, got no shoes, no socks. We had to leave all of our clothes back at the beginning. And we're standing there in our underwear, and I heard somebody over my right shoulder say, Oh, no, I don't believe it. And, and I, I looked around. It was a drill sergeant, and he had a really strict look on his face. He looked angry. <laughs> and he came to the two guys in front of me, and he said, I don't believe you two are standing right here talking. You better get on down and give me 20. And so they went down to do push-ups, 
And then they did like one and a half push-ups. And he said, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. And he said, I'm Drill Sergeant Randall Hines. I'm from Alabama. I'm going to be your new drill sergeant. And uh, he said, where are you two boys from? And the guys in front of me said, uh, we're from New York. And he said, you better say from New York drill sergeant, sir. And they said, oh, we're from New York drill sergeant, sir. He said, get on, get up, get up, get down, get down, get down. Give me 20. And so they're doing 20. And they do like four. And he, and, he, and he says, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Now let me start over again. Where are you gentlemen from? And they said, we're from New York drill sergeant, sir. And he said, you better get on down. And anyway, he reintroduced himself each time. Each time. And finally, on the third time, he said, now, let me just reiterate one more time. I am Drill Sergeant Randall Hines. I am from Alabama. Where are you from? And they finally got the idea, and they said, Alabama, Drill Sergeant, sir. <laughs> well, I was still thinking, guy's a psycho. He's yeah. a psycho. He uh-huh. also went up to them. You know, they have Smokey the Bear hats that have an absolutely flat brim. And then the top you know about because the yeah. bear wears it. Of course. <laughs> so he would go up to them and he'd put his hat right in their forehead like this. And then he would go and the hat would go up and down and it would move their forehead. And all the while he's glaring at them. And I thought, Drill Sergeant Hines is a psycho. This is going to be bad. Well, I soon realized that he was a comedian. He was so funny and he was a good-hearted guy. That's why I never, nobody ever got to do all 20 push-ups, ever. Mm-hmm. I never saw that. Hmm. One time, well, he be, and he came to realize that I was the only one in the platoon who was just in hysterics over what he was doing. <laughs> I got it. I mean, he was a lot like Jonathan Winters. He had a similar face, even though he was only 18. I was 23, right? So he's our <laughs> He's, he's our superior, boss. yeah. He's, he's 18. 18. He, he, he's been to Vietnam. And, and Cambodia, and come back. But it turns out he loves to do comedy. And he, I mean, he wasn't going to be a comedian or anything like that. His father worked in the Timex factory in Alabama. And he was, when he got out of the Army, when he retired, he said, the Army's my home. But when I retire, I'm going to go work for Timex. It was a, you know, it was a, linea, a lineage that he was part of. Mm-hmm. So he realized that I loved listening to him. I just was I couldn't stop from laughing. And so he played to me. And one time we were all, it was like after hours, it was, we'd had dinner, it was a summer evening, it was maybe 8.30 at night, and lights out was at 9. And all of a sudden we hear the whistle blowing. And he called our platoon out, we heard the whistle blowing, and said, you better get on down here! And we're upstairs in the barracks, he's down in the back. And we get down there and you just automatically trained that you fall into formation and you stand there at attention. But there was nobody there. <laughs> Where was and we're standing there, and, we, and you know we're we're already trained enough to know we better not do anything. We better not wander off. Yeah. And then the door opens up, and and he comes out and he's swinging his whistle in a circle, and he stands on this little porch, and he does the speech from Cool Hand Luke. What we have here is a failure to communicate verbatim. He knows the speech and he does it exactly as it is in in the movie. And I was falling all over myself. It was that, so. It was so funny. He was such a good guy. He was really a good guy. And I just. He just entertained me. I, I got a personal show for the whole two <laughs> yeah, months. I love it. Uh, there were many things like that in the army. I mean, I was lucky to live in the cadre room. Like my philosophy of being in the army was, I wanted to disappear into the middle. I wanted to be PFC nothingman. No identity, nothing really good about me, nothing really bad. I wasn't really smart. I wasn't really stupid. I wasn't really athletic. I wasn't, very, I wasn't clumsy. I just disappeared into the middle, and, be, and I didn't want them to know my name or anything. I never volunteered. And so that was, that was my approach to the, to the whole thing. Uh, and it worked pretty well. Do you feel like your time in the reserve helped inform anything about your view of life or, or, or who you were as a person going forward other than the, you know, you definitely did not want to go to war? It was formative for that reason. And it was formative because it, it was one more step in appreciating characters. I still treasure the characters that I met there. They were just so funny. They're such fun people. I mean, not fun people. Just the observation of their characters was just fun to do. Mm-hmm. And they were... 
I tell you, this, this could go on all. This could go on for days because there were so many stories about these characters. But anyway, it, it was one more building block in, block in my theatrical journey, yeah. and it was also a building block in my conscientious objection journey. I, I saw how it worked. I saw how your how old people get to tell young people what to do and run out there and die and then report back here. Because old people are already too smart. <laughs> they send the young That's ones. Right. They're like, I don't want to go there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, but, but, but I have to say seriously, though, I'm not anti-military, and I, I owe a debt of huge gratitude to our soldiers in World War II and prior to that. But I felt that the nature of war had fundamentally changed with the advent of nuclear weapons. Previously, it had been an unconditional effort to survive or prevail. You know, a country would muster their strongest people, send them out, they would all fight with the other side, and then the winner, the, that culture would prevail. But with nuclear weaponry, by the time I was doing this, we had powers of overkill on the order of something like 15 or 20 times. If one leader, if Khrushchev pushed the button, or if our leader pushed the button, uh, there was enough weaponry that would automatically go off to destroy everything on the planet 20 times over. So that was the absurd world we were living in. How is war supposed to be a deterrent? How are you supposed to prevail if you're all dead? So I thought, I know this is a, it sounds like a cliche, nobody would survive a nuclear war. And that was real war. That was the only war left that was real. Therefore, the battles that we did have seemed like negotiation tactics. They seemed like political moves. You know, it's equivalent of shaking your fist, except you send some guys over to kill some of their guys, yeah. you know, and people die because we're negotiating. <laughs> yeah, and, and what's the point anyway in the end if you can just push the button and everything goes away? Yeah, and I, and I have to say I'm not, I'm still proud of being in that position. I, I wish everybody were because we wouldn't have war. So, but you did go to college. What did you study in college? What were well, the things Matt, you were... I, st- <laughs> I know. What did you study? I don't. I don't I know. I studied, studied industrial I design. I went okay. to Art Center and I studied industrial design. I, I was the first person in my family to go to college. So my parents, you know, none of us knew how to, what to do other than be in college preparatory classes at school. Uh-huh. So in senior year, it was time to apply, and everybody is thinking, "Well, I'm going to go to UCLA. I want to be a pharmacist." And uh, I'm going to be a doctor, and I'm going to be, yeah. you know, I think I'll be, I'm going to auto shop because I want to work in a, as a mechanic. So everybody had a direction. I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, what do I apply for? I mean, I, I, what would my major be? What's my career? I don't want to, I don't, my dad was an engineer. That was the closest thing. And he had helped me learn to build things. So I thought, well, I've always wanted to be a car designer. So I'll, I'll apply to Art Center College of Design. It just happened that eight miles away was what at the time was the leading school in the world for that. I thought, that's really fun. I didn't stop to think that I would have to live in Detroit, um, which you know was the only place you could go do car design in the States at that time. Now you get to live in on the California coast. you know. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I didn't think it through. I just thought, cars, I like cars, I'll, do, I'll be a car designer. It sounded like yeah. a lot of fun. I got in there and I realized, oh, I don't love Good cars word. as much as I thought I did. There were people... <laughs> There were people who knew what a Hispano Suiza was, and I didn't know that. I, um, I, I realized there were huge gaps in my knowledge. It was because I just wasn't as passionate. I also didn't go through the halls like some of them going. <laughs> <laughs> so that was another factor. And so I changed to product design. So I now became an industrial designer, which uh, that was like uh, a year and a half or two years in. I changed my major, and now I could design anything, anywhere. It's meant you could design toasters, you could design consumer products, you could design cars, you could, anything you wanted to design, you could find a job and do it, and you didn't have to be in one place. So and that's that, the, is that what led to H, your job at HP? It's kind of. I mean, that's it's really weird. Did they, did they hire you to be the to to design products? Yes, they did. Yeah, but, but it wasn't my first job. I got I went to Henry Dreyfus Associates when I got out of school, and they were one of the two premier industrial design firms in the country. They did AT and T. They did John Deere tractors, American Airlines interiors, and so forth. So I went there, and then uh, and then uh, then I had to go do active duty. So I left 
Dreyfus, and they had to move to New York City. When I got out of the Army, I, I didn't really want to move to New York City. I went and talked to them, but I didn't really want to go there. Um, I was in Northern California. I really liked it, so we parted company, and then I got the job at HP. And so now I was in Silicon Valley. But, you know, I want to keep this general. You know, I started out saying yeah. that all lives are epic. Yeah. And, and the thing about about this was that it just didn't, ex it was fun work to do, and there was nice surroundings and nice people, um, but it just didn't feel like my life. You know, I, I just thought, well, I don't want to be a manager. I don't want to, I don't want to go vertical in the corporation. I'm not interested in that. Yeah. I don't want to work for a consulting firm because, you know, there somebody owns a company and their job is to make money off of you while you're working there. And so you earn even less you do in a corp than you do in a corporation. And I didn't want to go into business for myself because I, again, I just wasn't quite that passionate about it to, to try to have a business. I didn't even know how to do that. So I was kind of stuck. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, I just thought, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm going to do really. And uh, what my life will be. Will I be here in this cubicle until I'm 65 and they give me a watch? I was 25 at the time. I did not know. And so well, I think a lot of people feel that way, Dave. I think a yeah. lot of people get to a certain point in their life where they're like, they've, they've got a college, they've gotten that degree. They get out and they get their first job or their second job or their, even their third job. And they're like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't, this isn't me. Yeah. I think that's really common. And it's part of it is yeah. because of the way we have to choose majors in college. And I think it's worse now than it was then that, um, you somehow you're <laughs> you're 17 you live in your parents house choose what you want to do what do you yeah. know you might be rich you might be poor yeah. you you might be uh in an abusive environment or you might be in a very happy household but how the hell you know maybe you've been to your to work with one of your parents so maybe you've seen what it's like to sell shoes or maybe you've seen what it's like to be a doctor yeah but that's all you know really and you're at school you have lots of friends and you never ask their parents how their job is. You just don't, I saw that with myself and I saw it with our kids. That was the furthest thing from their mind. Right. You know? So they, you know, they're unprepared. So they decide, um, well, I guess I, I guess I want to be a career counselor. And yeah. so I'm going to go to, to the Valley College and study that. Anyway, you're not, you're not prepared to make any decisions. So there you find yourself out having a job and w questioning whether it's the right fit for you. And, you know, if by any chance you have a family or, 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 you know, or even a marriage at that point, then you, you really have a need for cash flow, you know, and it's yeah, hard, to, hard to save money. You may not be able to follow whatever your big dream is. Yeah. And, or you may not know. I mean, listen, when I was know. at HP, the designers, there were about, I don't know, 20 or 30 of us who we would have a boondoggle day every so often, like a couple times a year, we would go out to somebody's beach house and we would sit around and talk about design all day. And it was really a way of getting out of work, you know, yeah. just not having to go into the office. So we're sitting there, and everybody was talk looking at me because I was young, and I had saved money. I had money saved up. And they said, Dave, why don't you get out while you can? You, can get, you, you know, you can get out. You can do something. You can see the world. You can go somewhere. They all had wives and kids. They were all locked mm -hmm. down. And they looked at me as though I had to live their lives for them. They said, you've got savings, you can go, you could go right now. And I said, I can go, but I don't know what to do. So I would just blow my savings and come back. So I, I just need to figure out what I would really like to do. And of course, secretly, I really didn't believe that there was going to be any revelation coming. I didn't have any reason to think that I would figure out what to do. Did you feel lost? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, lost in a good way, lost in a first world way. I had a, I had a great job. I had a good income. I had a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. I, I had a bicycle. Yeah, and but life it just was, was great. But it was the fact that it was the thing that you were doing day after day after day was not maybe what you wanted to spend those many many years of your life doing. It, it right? like I mean, the army. It just didn't quite feel like. It was maybe really my real life. Is this really yeah. what my life's going to be? Like now it's, now it's just a straight line till the end. So how did, so, how did you make that turn? Well, did that turn it was happen? really accidental. I mean, that's what's so marvelous. Um, all I, when people say, what do I do? I, I always say, be, be ready when luck comes. What happened to me was I, I had a friend, and I, I thank this friend all the time. It's Mark Waxman. It's the same guy. Oh, the same guy, yeah. Mark, at that time, we were 20, 
three or something. He was a producer for the PBS station in Los Angeles. And he had a show coming out. He produced a television show. You could get opportunities like that at a young age within the PBS system. And I got out my TV to watch it. I had a Sony black and white TV that was five inch, five inch screen. It was this little thing that was in my closet because it was, you know, this was like 1971 or something. And uh, nobody watched TV in my age group. You know, we never looked at any TV. It was just put away. And I got it out thinking I'll watch Mark's program. I never got organized enough to actually tune in at the right time and see his program. <laughs> but I accidentally caught Sesame Street one morning. And I, it caught my eye, and I was just riveted. Turned out in those days they played all five episodes for the week on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And it became a ritual for me. I was stuck to that TV. Every Saturday I would sit down on the couch and watch my little black-and-white Sony to see what the Muppets were going to do on Sesame Street. I had been a Muppet fan before. I had watched the Muppets on Ed Sullivan during college, I love them, but the Sesame Street was a new thing. I hadn't seen them do characters before. And I was fascinated with, in particular, Ernie and Bert. And I've told this story a lot, so I'll be, I'll be brief. But the, Ernie and Bert looked like their characters. Uh, one was high contrast, you know, uh, bright yellow skin, black eyebrow, cutting across his eyes. It was harsh. He had vertical stripes. Ernie had horizontal stripes on his shirt at rest. Horizontal in design world means it's at rest. It's peaceful. The ocean is horizontal. The horizon is horizontal. Trees are vertical. They're erupting from the ground. So I just got curious as to who designed the puppets, who wrote the material, who performed it, and who built the puppets. I just thought somehow they're all on the same page. And I imagined, I imagined a big room in New York with big windows and where they would just sit around and rap. Because, mm -hmm. like, it was 1971. And right. I thought they would be rapping about, hey, man, what's Bert like? <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, but he'd wear this. Uh -huh. I thought it was like that. And then I got there and I realized, oh, it's a business. They really work hard. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't have that understanding at that moment. But I just got curious. And the curiosity would have faded if not for one lucky thing. We'll be back with Dave Gulls in a few minutes, but first it's time for a Jerry story. Today's Jerry story comes to us by way of Peter Linz, who has this to say about the great Muppet performer. When I first started working on Sesame Street, I was often assigned to right-handing or assisting Jerry Nelson. I was so completely intimidated by him. It was nothing he was doing. He was just so cool, and I was so green and new and inexperienced. There were... However, a few times that I felt like I connected with Jerry and I wasn't, I could stop being such a fanboy and, and just talk with him. One of these times, he shared with me counting to 10 in Zen. Now, tragically, I had completely forgotten what it was precisely he said, but I remembered the counting to 10 in Zen and I remembered a few words of it. So some time ago, I got in touch with his wife, Jan Nelson, and she said, oh, I remember him doing that. And, I, and she couldn't remember it either. But what she did remember is that Jerry would, uh, wrote it down on, uh, on a tablecloth, one of those paper tablecloths with the crayons, and she had a picture of it. And it took her some time, but she eventually found the picture. And what it shows is Roadmap to Happiness. And it's got a circle with a line through it showing a human heart. And then it's the follow the arrow, and it's an actual, you know, Valentine's heart-shaped heart. And he wrote in red letters, Stop here and listen. Counting to ten in Zen. Sun, do, see, core, hive, fix, heaven, straight, line, zen. I don't know what exactly what it means, but I really like it, and I'm going to try not to forget it. 1964-1965, New York World's Fair and Meeting Jim, Part 1. When the New York World's Fair started in 1964, I worked in Bill's shop helping to build the show. There were some great people working with Bill and Cora at that time. Franz Fazakis, Foz, I would work with Foz later at Muppets, Frank and Fanny Sullivan, 
Carl and Marianne Harms, and Bill used a sculptor named Ernst to make all his molds. When the show was built, we put it on its feet out at the World's Fair site in Flushing Meadows, Queens. The show is for Chrysler, and the name of the show was The Chrysler Show-Go-Round. The stage was a huge turntable in the center of the building, and there were four theaters. Stage one would start the show to audience one, and at the end of the stage one show, the announcer would say, Let the show go round! and the turntable would turn, taking stage one to audience two, at the same time bringing stage two to audience one, which had the entertainment part of the show. And the show would continue around until audience one had seen the three parts of the show. That number one theater would then empty out and reseat a new audience, and so it would go on for the two seasons of the New York World's Fair, 1964 and 1965. My first job when I was discharged from the U.S. Army was working as a page at WRC, the local NBC affiliate in Washington, D.C. One of my duties was to deliver teletypes and mail to news and various other departments at the station. Often my travels would take me across the studio floor where different shows would rehearse and air. Sometimes I would see a young Jim Henson and his wife-to-be Jane setting up to do their show, Sam and Friends. Little did I know then that my future would be so connected to this young couple. The Chrysler Show Go Round had four crews of puppeteers and stage managers, and on one of these crews was a young man named Bobby Payne. One day, near the end of the World's Fair, Bobby asked me if I knew who the Muppets were. Bobby had worked for Jim in Washington, D.C. In addition to the Salmon Friends show, they had done many very funny commercials. And I told Bobby that I did know who they were and that I loved the work they did. He said that the Muppets had moved to New York, and he thought I should go see Jim, because it would be mutually advantageous to both Jim and me. He thought our senses of humor would mesh very nicely. I called Jim and made an appointment to meet with him. At that time, Muppets had two floors above a restaurant named Chuck's Composite on the east side of Manhattan. I met with Jim, told him my background, and he asked me to make an audio tape of some character voices. I went directly home and made the tape and took it back to him the next day. He called me the following morning and asked when I could start. Bling, bling. Can a young man from a little cow town out west make good in the big time? Well, at that time it wasn't all that big. The Muppets after I joined were comprised of Jim Henson, Jerry Jewell, Don Celine, Frank Oz, one secretary, and myself. Six in all. As opposed to the hundreds that were to make up the company in later years. Thanks, Peter. A little bit later on, we're going to hear a song from Jerry Nelson. But now, back to the show. We're back with Dave Goals. This girlfriend that I knew in L.A., and she wasn't a girlfriend, she was just a friend, but she was going to come up for the weekend. And on a Thursday, I thought, I better buy a newspaper to see what's going on, because all I do is watch Sesame Street. And I, I don't know, <laughs> right. I don't know who's in into it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know who's giving a concert this weekend. I don't know, right. you know what's going on. So I bought the newspaper, and all I saw was one article about Frank Oz coming to Oakland to perform for the Puppetry of, Puppeteers of America Festival. And that was it. I didn't read anything else in the newspaper. The, the girl came and left. We had a great time. But all I was thinking about was the next Tuesday. And I took a day of vacation from Hewlett Packard, and I drove up to Oakland early in the morning, and I watched Frank do a workshop of puppets for television. And then I watched him do a show. And this is where the question that my fellow employees asked was answered because they said, why don't you just do something? You can do anything. I see Frank in the show, and now I'm like Lee Harvey Oswald. I get there an hour and a half ahead of time to the theater. Yeah, <laughs> It's an amphitheater that is a U-shaped building with a big natural auditorium outside, you know, a banked audience seating. And I found a window... I could see a playboard up on the stage, which is a board that you hide behind when you're a puppeteer. Mm -hmm. So I could see that the best place for me would be beside that, like parallel to it. And I found a second floor window, and I went up there, and there were just boxes in storage up there. And I had three rolls of high-speed ectochrome film, 36 exposures each, a telephoto lens, a camera, so I really was like Lee Harvey Oswald. I put some of the boxes in front of the window. I made a nest for myself yeah. so that I could shoot. And then I just waited. I just hid there until the show started. And Frank did a brilliant show 
with a guy named Daryl, who was an old friend of his from Oakland. And Cookie Monster, Bert, and Grover were there. And I photographed the whole thing from the side so that I could see him working them. This fascinated me from yeah. childhood on, you know. And then they announced that there was going to be a second show because it had been in the newspaper and it was so popular that they had to turn away a whole, a whole other house of people. So there was going to be a second show. And for this one, I got in the center of the audience because I thought, well, let me see it from here now. Yeah. And... All around me, I was surrounded by parents with their children, and the children were carrying little Burt dolls, little Ernie puppets, and they, these were clearly things they slept with and they treasured. They, they were all worn from being nuzzled. Mm -hmm. And then Frank came on and did the show, and I was, I was, I think I was kind of moved to tears almost. I, I don't remember, but I probably had tears because. It was so profound that he was reaching not just the children, but the parents, too, and that the children adored these characters. And I adored them. And I felt like one of the children, in a way. And we got up after the show, and we're all filing out of the amphitheater. And I'm in this crowd and thinking, tomorrow I have to go back to HP and design boxes. But that's what I ought to be doing. This was the moment for you. That you was the moment. Was. That was the moment. That's what it ought to be doing. It wasn't quite the moment because I didn't think I have to do that. But at I'm some going point, to do it. It, it, you you thought that that's the thing I need to do. But I realized that's what I that's what I should be doing. But how I didn't do you see do any, it? Yeah, I didn't see any way to do it. Yeah, I go back to HP. I said I described the day. It was amazing, and I went back to work. But I had I had spoken to Frank at that at that uh, workshop that he gave. I I asked him two questions. Uh, one was how is Grover's nose made. And I've told this before, everybody will know who's listened before, but uh, he said, uh, oh, I don't know, we have people who do that. <laughs> and, oh, my. And okay. so uh, I didn't get my answer on that one, but I said also, I said, if, if I were to ever get to New York City, would it be possible to visit Sesame Street? And he said, oh, sure, just call me when you get to town. <laughs> well, a month later, I get a business trip. I never got business trips. Yeah. Nobody ever, ever asked me to go anywhere. And suddenly, I had a business trip to Pennsylvania, which is close to New York. Pretty close. So I spent a week there working on my project. And then I went and took a week of vacation time to go to New York City. And I slept on my friend Keith Raddick's floor. And Keith Raddick, you have met too. He's the oral surgeon. Yes. So uh, I slept on his floor. And on the Monday morning at about 10 o'clock, because I waited till 10 o'clock because it was a respectable hour. Yes. I looked up Frank in the telephone book. He was still there under his real name, Osnowitz, which I knew, and he answered the phone. And, and I now, mind you, I haven't prepared for this in advance. I didn't write a letter. I didn't call the company. I just called Frank because he said, call me. Okay. He did not give me his number. But anyway. You looked it up. He answers. Yeah. I mean, this is me being mostly an idiot, but partly enterprising. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just lucky that he was in the phone book at that time. And I, he, he, and I told him, I reminded him of what he said. And he said, oh, sure, let me make a phone call and I'll call you back in five minutes. Five minutes later, he said, it's all set. Go to Teletape Studios, 81st and Broadway, and uh, ask for so-and-so at the door. Now, Frank, he said, I won't be in there until Friday, but so-and-so will look after you and I'll tell Carol Spinney that you're coming. I get there, and I'm, now I'm, I know Carol Spinney already, <laughs> who does Big Bird, for anybody who doesn't know. He did Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch, originated the characters. Anyhow, I got there, and I was now in a different world. This was not Hewlett Packard. This was a world of artists, uh, scenic artists, sound people, music people, lighting people, cinematographers, directors. It was a whole world that I used to sneak into when I was a kid. Yeah. So it wasn't alien to me, but I met the Muppet people and I thought, my God, they are nice folks. They are lovely people. What a, what a joy it must be to work here and to do Sesame Street, which is a landmark thing. It's a huge part of our culture. I was absolutely thrilled. I just couldn't believe I And I stayed there the whole week. I went in every day for the full shoot. And I got to know Carol a little bit. And, and uh, on Tuesday, I took my puppets in in an HP box. Mm -hmm. You know, an HP box that you would buy a product in. I had, yeah. I had taped it shut and put a rope on it so that I could carry it. 
to and check it in as baggage. And it had three puppets that I had built. And I, I showed him the puppets, and he said, gee, these are these are really good. You should meet Bonnie Erickson, uh, who was running the workshop at the time. And so he said, she, they're just across town. Why don't you go see her? I'll call her. So he called her and told her that I was coming. And I got there later in the afternoon, and I walked into this room, and there was a shrine there. It was just Bonnie's work desk or workbench, but Ernie was sitting on it on a stand. And Ernie himself was a shrine for me. I literally was in Mecca, and I walked in, and I all I could see was Ernie, and I walked over, and I know as a craftsman, you don't touch other people's work. You don't touch art. But I looked at it from all angles, and I was just studying the smile curves and the little ridge that he had around the back of his head on that one, and his costume and the way the sweater was made, and I was just fascinated. And then I gradually became aware that sitting behind her, and he was a woman with big blue eyes, blonde hair, <laughs> watching me. Wow. <laughs> and so we struck up a conversation, and she knew she was expecting me, and we chatted, and I showed her my puppets, and she said, these are really good. Jim ought to see these, but he's in France right now at an Unima convention. So I'm sorry you'll miss him, but I will tell him that you came. And now this is the point where I become aware in the story that I was thinking, like I did at every stage, this is amazing. I, I'll never forget this. Yeah. Like meeting Frank at the festival back two months before, I will never forget that I got to talk to the guy who does Grover. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget this. It's so great. And then when I got to Sesame Street, I'll never forget that I got to visit this amazing place yeah. without having to sneak in. <laughs> That's true. And, and so this was another moment. I thought, I will never forget that Bonnie said, Jim should see your puppets. Yeah. That's enough to carry me for the rest of my life. Yeah, I mean, I'll go back how, could it to get, how could it get any better than that? Yeah, than these that was moments. great. That was just great. I'll go back to HP, and I'll always have that. Yeah. I'll always have that she said that. Well, I went back to HP, and I'm you know, sitting there a month and a half later, about a month later, I guess, and the phone rang. My phone rang, which it did all day long. And I picked up, and this guy said, Hi, this is Jim Henson. And I went, I don't know what the... <laughs> <laughs> and my legs were jerking involuntarily in, in my chair. I looked like I being, was being electrocuted. And I stood up and looked around the lab. I, I, the lab was about an acre of partitions. And so when you stand up, you could see the whole thing. And I looked around and I thought, nobody in here is talking to Jim Henson. And then I realized, I'm talking to Jim Henson. I better say something else. So yeah. I said, hi. <laughs> and... And we, he, he invited me to come to L.A. where he was going to be appearing on a Perry Como special. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll come down. And he said, I hear your puppets are nice. Can you bring those too? And I said, sure. His mother had died the day before, and he uh, was going to meet me for breakfast, but Jerry Nelson showed up instead and explained it, and I said, I'll go, I'll go home. We'll meet some other time. Not a good time. And He said, no, Jim wants to meet you, which was my first inkling that Jim was something different, mm-hmm. that, he was, that he was strong. And so anyway, we did meet, and, and then while we were talking, Jane arrived from New York to be with him, and then they, they were going to go off together. So we ended our meeting, and Jim said, you know, we're shooting tonight. Would you like to come by and watch the shoot? We're shooting with Perry Como tonight. And, and I said, sure. So I came back that evening and, and uh, went in through the artist's entrance. I always had to sneak in the other ways. <laughs> yeah. But this time I, <laughs> I was yeah. authorized. And I sat down in the audience seating. There was no audience for this. With Jane Henson. She flagged me over and we sat down together and we're watching and I'm just riveted. I just thought it was so fascinating to watch Jim and Frank work. They were both there at that point. And when it was, during that time, Jane leaned over to me and she said, so are you going to be working with us? And I said, oh, I, I don't know. We hadn't really gotten that far. We hadn't really talked about that. And she said, I'm sure Jim will find something for you to do. And at the time, I thought, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe he will. I don't know. I'm just in New York. I don't want to go. I was having all those thoughts. (laughs) Right. But here it is, like, almost 50 years later. Well, it actually is 50 years after that. And I'm still doing it. I mean, uh, it is amazing that we do have these moments in our life that that we think, this cannot get any better than this. And how... Amazing it is that that you are at this place 
that you are at this point in your in your career, not now, but then, mm-hmm. where you are joining Jim Henson's company and building puppets, right? That's what you yeah. ended up doing. You ended up building puppets, thinking that's that's what you're going to do. Did you ever think you were going to perform? Oh, I told Jim when I met him, and this was again at CBS Television City. <laughs> Wait, I met him in a rehearsal hall there, and one of the things I said was, uh, he said, well, I, th- I think you could be, he said, I think you could be useful to us. For, you know, you can build puppets. These are great. Um, I said, but what I'm really interested in is puppeteering. I'm per- per- interested in performing. And he said, well, uh, we have three star puppeteers plus Carol, who works on the street all the time. So we don't need anybody right now, but, you know, you could join us and if we, uh, we could work with you on puppeteering a little bit and then, if something came up like a special, we we could we could use you in that. Hmm. And cutting forward, Jim was absolutely true to his word the way he always was. He was always he always delivered what he promised or better. And so during the summer that I went to work in the workshop for six months as a trial thing, I just got a leave of absence from HP. He and Frank came in two evenings after work, and we met, and they taught me a few things about puppeteering, and, they, and at the same time, they were seeing what I could do and so on. And so he he met his obligation there, and then at the end of my six months, we got a special, which was the Valentine special with Mia Farrow, and I uh, got to do three characters in that. So he more than met his promise, more than met, you know, as he always did. Yeah, and see it to me. This is epic. Yeah, it is. But you're meeting this person that you were certainly inspired by, even if you didn't. Yeah, I mean, you you knew who Jim was, and you had seen his work. Everything seemed to be leading to this moment, whether you knew it or not. You know, there I think- were all those formative building blocks that I referred to, and there were others that I didn't cover. But there were lots of little show business hints that I wasn't supposed to be in the world of engineering. I, I kind of wanted to be in show business somehow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. love it. It's and just amazing. It is. And all of the things that you've gotten to do along that journey are just incredible. You say it's epic, that your experience is unique. Would you, wouldn't you say? Yes, it's very unusual. It's not exactly unique, but it's very unusual. And I, I n- never forget to be grateful for it. It somehow the universe seemed to just bestow this upon me and I was really lucky lucky to be in, to be there and to be a part of it and to you know to try to contribute to it so it's really been an amazing life i feel that the universe took a special exception for me for that, yeah. i don't know or it was random whatever happened it was however luck. it happens it doesn't matter it was, it was great good things. fortune and i and i'm so grateful for it i am yeah. so grateful but I still contend that everybody's life is epic. I mean, I really do think, you know, I could still be assembling garbage disposals at Waste King Universal. Mm-hmm. Actually, I was going to tell somebody else this story. Do you want to hear about there, about working there? Yeah. This was a summer job uh, when I was in college. It was my last summer before graduation. And I got a job assembling garbage disposals on a little assembly line at the Waste King Universal Company. And we... Uh, there were 11 of us on the line, and each person had a couple of operations that they did. Okay. Mine was to screw water slingers and oil slingers in with a, uh, an air drive screw gun. And it was on a coil coming from above. And so I would just go, flip, 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 flip. and then I would turn around and get a water slinger, and then I'd get an oil slinger, and I'd go get four screws, flip, 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 flip. and then I would turn around and get more. This is on eight hours all day. Yeah. Now, You would naturally wonder, well, how do you do that for eight hours a day? Well, I didn't know, but I worked with some lifers there, some guys who worked there as their career. One was Harry Moore. He was a black guy who was just the coolest guy. And he worked just upstream of me. And he was just so high concept. And and he called me Waldo because I had glasses and I went to college. And Harry was a really nice guy. Yeah. What we called a lifer, you know. I don't know. I didn't know how to do his job. I only knew mine. But anyway, when you get tired on an assembly line, you can't stop. You're not supposed to stop. You just have to keep going. Like Lucy, Lucille Ball. Uh, you know, the whole thing would just keep going. And 
and eventually it would come to a halt and it'd be your fault. And Nate Barrett, the foreman, would come over and yell at you. But, but Harry had a way to do it. He had a way to get a break when he wanted one. In behind us were these wire bins, big three-foot cube wire bins with full of parts that we put on the machines, right? My oil and water slingers were behind me. Something else was behind Harry. And there was a forklift truck driver named uh, George. And George, again, another guy, was this was his career, he would hear from people on the line what they needed, and he would go with the forklift truck and get a bin of those, move the empty bin out of the way, and put the full one in. And so we would all say, George, I need water slingers. And, uh, you know, Harry would do the same thing, but he would do it like this. He would say, George, this is a factory. It's uh-huh. noisy in there. <laughs> yeah. George, I need water slingers and owl slingers. Water and owl. Nothing. No, George, because nobody <laughs> heard. I mean, yeah. I could just barely hear it. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the line would come down. Nate Barrett would come running over and say, why well, is this line shut down? What happened here? And, and they says, well, here it says, I called George, but I needed some water slingers and oil slingers, but uh, he didn't come. You know, he was in another, another part of the place. He couldn't yep. hear. So we got a little break. We're all just relaxing, thanks to Harry Moore next Thank to Harry. me. And there were these two guys at the end of the line. They did the last operations, and they were really skilled. These guys were so good. And they were funny. They were always joking and laughing because they knew their jobs cold. They could do it until yeah. the cows came home. So every now and then, like maybe every day, they would start working really fast. And they would get their operations done, and they would go upstream, and they would start doing the next guy's operations and their own. And what? they would run back and forth and get parts and stuff, and then they would displace people. So when they got to me... They would just go like this, you know, they'd just give me a little gesture and I would step back and they would now be doing my job as well as all the rest of them. <laughs> and they worked their way right up to the very first position where the, where the garbage disposals didn't even exist yet. And uh-huh. they started doing that job, that first job on the line. And once they had those completely assembled, now you had a, like a 25 feet of garbage disposals lined up, complete, ready to ship. And we would all just sit back and rest. <laughs> but these guys would do things like that because they were so good at what they did. And they, what my point about all this is they made an art form, form out of their job. They made their jobs epic. For that, they're my heroes. Harry Moore and those two guys at the end of the line. <laughs> they're just so great. I love those guys. I love them. Anyway, you were asking about Jim. So, yeah, I was wanting to know what kind of a leader was he I mean, he had he was the boss of hundreds of people. I would refer you to Muppet Guys talking for for a better answer than I can give because it's a good sixty minutes of talking about how Jim gave so many people such wonderful opportunities. Um, and you didn't just get an opportunity to be a part of something; you got a, an opportunity to contribute, and that opportunity extended to everybody in the room. You know, when Jim was in the studio. Anybody working there felt that they could go up to him and make a suggestion or, t- or chat with him. And so suggestions came from all the jobs in the studio, you know, cinematographer, stagehand, anybody. Um, and Jim would listen and he would think about it and consider it. And the person was very grateful to be included in the process. And if he liked the idea, he always made the ultimate decision and everybody understood that. But if he liked a suggestion from anybody, he would use it. And, you know, there was an investment by all the people on the production in making it as good as it could be because of that. It's rare. I think that it's type really of rare. leader is, is really rare. Yeah. So on The Muppet Show, let's talk about that for a little bit. Okay. You had a character called Gonzo. Yeah. How did he come about? Gonzo, uh, the idea for Gonzo came from Jerry Jewell about a, a sort of a loser who <laughs> who uh, comes up with these stupid acts and thinks that they are high art. And so he was written into the show, and Jim picked that puppet, the old uh, uh, cigar box frackle from the Santa Claus switch for the character, and then he asked me if I would try it. And so I did. And at first, he was a very meek, downtrodden, insecure guy because I felt that way. I was working on my first season of a big variety show, and I had utterly no qualifications other than sneaking into CBS. 
<laughs> I had not studied acting. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I mean, I had instincts. I had. I think I had oh, yeah. good instincts, but um, but I just didn't feel. I didn't feel entitled to be in in the room. You know, I've always said that a guest would walk in uh, to the rehearsal hall, and it had two doors. So Danny Kay walks in one door, I go out the other, because I just thought, I'm supposed to be at home on the couch. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be here. This is backstage. Right. And I need but to go back to... But you're supposed to be there. I need to go <laughs> back to my parents' house in Burbank and get on the couch and wait, just wait for the show to come on. So Gonzo was kind of you at that time. He was... That was, I could only project my own feelings about this onto him, and so he, he reflected a lot of what my personality was like at the time and certainly how I felt in that context. And Frank was my mentor. He became my mentor. I love Frank's work, and I loved the depth of his characters and the, the thinking that he put into them. That was just aligned with the way I did things, so we, uh, we got to be good friends. And um, he would always say, your job is to be a fool. Just take chances. Just do it. You know, just be a fool. And... Um, I couldn't. I couldn't relax enough to be to to let loose and and be a fool because I just didn't feel qualified. However, I I now feel comfortable being a fool. That's why I say it's an epic life. Like not many yeah. people start out and then like 60, 70 years later they they are fully qualified to be a fool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how how long do you think it took you to finally give over to that and be and be comfortable? To be a fool, yeah, uh, and, and to be fairly good at it, probably about yeah. eight years. So that's beyond the Muppet Show. Yeah, it was in Fraggle where I started thinking, oh, maybe I could do this. I might be able to handle this. Really? Maybe. When you're given a character, how do you? Well, what is it that you connect to that makes you able to be a fool, or to, <laughs> to, to, to do that character? You know what I mean? To do that character. Well, it's not training. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, I, you think you're right. You have an incredible instinct, and now you have, have these years of experience. That... I have a love for characters. I just yeah. love characters. I love human folly. I love our self-delusion that we go through life with. I mean, really, I've often thought that at my memorial it would be nice to sing, have people sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. <laughs> because the lyrics are, are germane. I mean, uh -huh. here we are floating in a universe that is... It contains almost nothing and it has no boundaries that we're aware of. Space just goes on. And all that's in it are these little grains of minerals. You know, I mean, I'm talking about grains. Like a sun is just a, a grain yeah. in this vast expanse. And somehow we're born on this planet that is, is the only one we can see that we're aware of that could sustain this kind of life that we are. So what must be our significance in that list? <laughs> right, really right. Not, nothing. You know, life may flourish on the planet and then it may extinguish. And it will not have mattered at all to the rest of the universe. Yeah, I just saw this thing the other day where this uh, scientist was talking about looking out into the night sky and imagine a quarter being held, you know, held up 20 feet away from you. And you look at that quarter. Inside that quarter are an unimaginable number, millions, billions of stars and planets and universes. And like, it just goes on and on. It really tends to kind of make you feel very small and, and insignificant. Well, it, I, that analogy, I think, really works because it's full of particles. It's, it, we're still discovering subparticles and subparticles. And, and, unbelievable. Uh, you know, I think our cognizance of what reality really is is just at a very rudimentary level so far. Yeah. I don't think we have a clue. You know, Einstein had some sense that uh, <laughs> that time and space were the same thing, and that they could be, that it was warped. Uh -huh. It's it's above most of our heads. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, by the way, listeners, that was Matt. He just bumped his windscreen <laughs> on his microphone. Uh, so, but see, but that's the kind of thing. Are... That's the kind of thing that we could be concerned with. Yeah, we could think about. That's what, uh, what. There's no point in us trying to focus on what the hell is the universe. We just we just do things like don't touch the windscreen. Right, and then here I go bumping it. Yeah, but, but yeah, but I mean, it happens. It does. But, and you move on. You move on with your day. We operate at our little pedestrian levels. Like all, all the little ants on Earth, all of us little people, with our governments and our important mm -hmm. things that we have and our armies and our bombs, <laughs> yeah. it really doesn't matter even to people on Mars. 
Not that yeah. there are people on Mars, but, but if there were, none of it's of any care. consequence. It won't, it won't. No matter what happens here, it won't have any effect on anything in the universe. But we do have an effect here. I'm going to try to bring it back around to what we do. We create sometimes when it's the best of it. It's art, right? I well, would Matt, say- I'm glad you brought it back around because I think you're 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 helping me finalize my point, which is that all we have is our experience here. Mm-hmm. That's all we really have. So let's immerse ourselves in it. Let's enjoy it. Let's make it as good as we can. Let's make it good for everybody if we can. Let's make it good that's for a, other people, too. I mean, too. that seems easy to do. Let's not hurt each other. Right. We're all just here for a blink. Let's just enjoy it. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> uh, Dave, what I'm going to do now, because if I could, I would keep talking to you for hours and hours and hours, but you are a very busy person. <laughs> very <Yes>. busy. <laughs> You're very Certainly. busy. Certainly. So very, very occupied. Yeah, very busy. Things. So oh, I'm gonna. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna name uh, something that you've done. I would like you to tell me maybe the first thing that comes to your mind about that particular project, and just like I'll try. Uh, yeah, just see what happens. I don't it's, know. I feel a lot of pressure already. No, no, this. don't be. Pre- don't feel pressure. I would never want uh, you to feel pressure. But so this should be easy. Well, it's easy for you, easy. maybe. Yeah, well, hey, look, it's easy if me. I can't easy answer one, it. will you answer it for me? Yeah, I'll give you an answer. Sure. Okay. That, uh, okay, that takes already the pressure. Yeah, yeah pressure is off. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to just start with the Muppet Show. Well, okay. The problem with this premise yeah. of yours is yeah, yeah. that I mean, I know that's a what vast do I choose? Years. I know, but I said first thing that comes to your mind. What What was the first thing when I said Muppet Show? I'm afraid I'm not able to pick one at the moment. I mean, there were all I love kinds that. of things, like learning to drive in England. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Living in that. England. Living in yeah, living the living farthest in England, away that was from... was a whole big adventure. Right? I, I mean... mean... <laughs> <laughs> meeting meeting I... new new superstar guests every week. Well, that was the scary part. That was scary to me. So right? I... I mean, yeah, you were out the back door. All right, I'll tell you one superstar story. Okay. Um, we had Edgar Bergen on, and, and of course, a lot of the listeners won't even know who Edgar is, was... But he had ventriloquist dummies. He had Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Snerd, and Effie Klinker. And he was part of America, Americana. He was part of American culture. And for all of us who worked on the show, The Puppeteers, he was a hero. He was a giant. We all grew up watching him. We were enraptured by his work. And on the morning of the read-through for that episode, we did the read. And then the normal process was to, to rehearse for the afternoon. So we would, they would tape out the sets on the floor of the rehearsal hall, and we would, you know, block out where we were going to, how we were going to shoot the shots. But before we did that, they put a chair out, and Edgar took out Charlie McCarthy, and we were sitting there like little boys, with our tongues hanging out, with our, well, our mouths were hanging open, our tongues weren't out, but our mouths were open, and we were absolutely charmed and in awe and in love, and in that moment. I I would remember noticing this guy is a genius performer. I mean, I knew that I loved his characters as a kid, but technically as a performer and an actor and a you know, a performer of multiple characters, he was a genius. And we were all just awestruck. We all felt the same way. And then he got uh, Effie Klinker out and now he was a different character and Effie was funny and just it was just so heartwarming to be in this room with a linoleum floor and windows looking north and a gray sky outside. Very different from our living rooms all over the country where we grew up, watching him with our parents. And now we're sitting there in these wooden stacking chairs watching Edgar Bergen perform for us. It was, it was staggering, 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 staggering. And let me say one more time, staggering. Yeah. And then he got imagine. Mortimer snurred out. And Mortimer, who is the height of lovability, just won our hearts. Oh, my God. That's just one thing from the Muppet Show. And there were hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that you said at one point that you would have, uh, I guess during music rehearsals maybe it was, that you, everybody brought along a little um, a tape recorder. recorder. Yeah? Yeah. Wait, well, you know this. You're asking a question that you know. We, we would, well, I know, but I want to hear, I want to hear your version of it because so, I have a memory of it, but it's not, you know. 
Yeah, well, so Derek Scott, who was the musical director, would teach us our harmonies for each song. So each of us would roll our recorder and record our harmony, and he would pluck it out on the piano. And then we would meet with Elton, say, and he would run through the three songs that he did for that show, and we would rehearse with him. Well, what struck me immediately about Elton John was that he could, in fact, sing his songs flawlessly every time, and every time would be different, but never with a flaw. He was so talented. And, and, and this was true of most musical guests. They could sing their material. You know, it, it was chosen or written by them. And he played piano beautifully. So there was never a mistake from him. It was just me, <laughs> you know, trying to learn my parts, my, trying to learn my harmonies. And really, I had to learn the harmonies at home separately. I couldn't really learn them at the table because I wasn't that good. But I think I was always in awe that the guests could do what they did. And I always thought, every week we show up here and we create a show out of air. Mm. You know, a, it, it, it starts weeks ahead of time, of course. There's a yeah. conversation with the guest and the writers. There's uh, the, writer, the writing process. There's paper involved. They print it. We read it. And right. then we rehearse it. And then we modify it. We add things and subtract things. And then it gets shot and edited and goes out. But the startling thing to me was that we made the show out of nothing. It was just made out of air. I love that notion because that's true. It's nothing until it becomes something. Yeah, and the same concept applied to when I made model cars as a kid. That was another thing. I would buy model car kits, but I would modify them. I got so I would modify them so much that you couldn't tell what they had started as. So I used some raw materials in, in that, some sheet plastic and so forth, to add to the design of the car. And I remember at the time being in the, uh, I think, 8th uh, grade or 7th grade and thinking, when I get done with this, it will not have existed before. Uh, yeah. You know, pieces of this were just raw materials before, and now they're going to become something. It's the same exact idea that any artist uses to create their work. That we used on The Muppet Show. Um, that any craftsman uses. You know, uh, uh, lumber is delivered to a site and carpenters build a frame that becomes a house. Yeah. And there's an exciting thing about the act of creation like that. Out of air. Out of air. Uh, All right, I'm going to move on from The Muppet Show. Oh, yeah, this is supposed to be quick, isn't it? Yeah, right. (laughs) Emma Daughter. Jug Band Christmas. What comes to mind? Faz Fazakas, the electromechanical genius who built our radio control rigs, and mechanisms. Absolute genius. Wonderful, wonderful human being. Utterly unique. A testament to Jim for picking unique individuals who can do special things. And he built the rowboat that Emmett rides in with his mom, and he also built the Emmett and the mother who were radio controlled so that they could literally row and do anything that a person could do with a rowboat on this river that we built for Emma Daughter. So that was just an extraordinary thing. The Muppet movie, The Great Muppet Caper, Muppets Take Manhattan, like a, like just maybe something about each of them or something about that experience of shooting these three movies. Muppet movie, getting to go to California because we had been in the rain for like a year and a half in England. Yep. Um, we had one sunny summer. Our first summer in, in England was sunny, and I thought, oh, that's great. The people, boy, they sure appreciate the sun around here. They, they're all going out at lunchtime and taking off their shirts and <laughs> lying on the grass. And then the next summer, I understood why, because it rains all year round. So Frank and I, I know, were both just looking forward to getting to California. For, so we got there for the Muppet movie. It was really, really fun. And, of course, we were in a movie. It was my first time in a movie. I'll just say that, I'll just say that the single thing that I was mentioning there was getting to some sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And once again, it's a yeah. line becoming a circle where uh, suddenly I, I had a pass. I could, I could just drive on the lot every day. That's right. I yeah. did not have to sneak in. You didn't in. have to sneak in. Uh, the Great Muppet Caper. And by the way, I will say this, too. Yeah, 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 please. You only have the pass while you're working. Like, Matt and <laughs> I right. cannot... Yeah, you can't just we, drive up. <laughs> we can't just go into studios. No. It doesn't get any better. You always have to sneak in or have a pass. The Great Muppet Caper. Caper. Oh, gosh. Again, you know, it's a flood of things that I could mention. One thing yeah. was, it, uh, that just off the top of my head, it was fun to see Charles Grodin working. And it was fun to see uh, John Cleese again and see him working. Oh. 
every, every artist works in unique ways. You know, they all have their own process. And uh, I loved watching Chuck Grodin because he was just, he's so brilliant, absolutely brilliant at playing that certain kind of sleazy character that he had in that movie. And yeah, provocative and sleazy and confrontational, and, and, and he was loose, she was rich. She, oh, it was so much fun. But you still like him. You still, there's something about him that you, you like, like him, yeah, because, because he's, he's fun funny. to watch. So yeah. fun, yeah. 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 <laughs> Just, Absolutely. Again, having ringside seats to watch a genius at work. Same thing with John Cleese. Uh, Just, oh, God, what a brilliant guy. What a brilliant guy. And a, a little throwback to the Muppet Show when we when we did John the John Cleese episode, it was the next week uh, before or after the Dom DeLuise episode. And the day that we rehearsed for those episodes happened to be the same day. Instead of having a Sunday set aside for one guest, that Sunday we had both of them. So we we did a read through and a rehearsal, and then we had the other one in did a read through and a rehearsal. You got to see two comic geniuses work in opposite ways. Dom DeLuise just wanted to know when he had to react to something. Like, when does that little character come out of the crater on the moon? When does that prairie dog come up? And we said, well, he comes right after you say such and such. And he said, okay. We said, do you want to know what you have to do? And he said, no. I just want to know when he's coming. John Cleese, on the other hand, loved to play in, in rehearsal. He he. He really liked to ad lib and goof around, and then if something funny happened, he'd say, "Okay, hold, 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 hold," and he would start writing down. He said, "Now you said, okay," and then then Kermit said, "What?" and he would write it all down, and that would become our rewrite. Of course, the writers were part of this too. Our writers, yeah. Jerry Jewell was there, our guys were there, but that was the exact opposite of Dom DeLuise's way of working. And yeah. to see that there's room in the arts for both is heartening, and that they both fit. On this particular show. They so both, both fit both perfectly. Fit. They both fit perfectly. Part of that was because of Jim having Catholic tastes and wanting to make the guests look good. He always wanted to make our guests look good. It was paramount to him. He wanted them to be comfortable doing something that they wanted to do. Maybe they'd never had a chance to do before. Yeah. Like Beverly Sills always wanted to tap dance. And so he said... Tap dancing it is. Our That's show was great. a place where they could do that. They could be themselves and they could do what they wanted to do. Uh, Muppets Take Manhattan. Muppets Take Manhattan. <laughs> um, I had a great apartment. I had an amazing apartment. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was on the, uh, I don't know, 15th or 16th floor overlooking the Hudson at Riverside and 77th. And it was an apartment that belonged to a television personality who was going out of the country for a while with her husband. And I got to stay there. And every morning when I woke up, I would look out my window and I would see something different happening on the Hudson. There was always something different. A new kind of ship was going up. Some riverboat was coming down. They were docking some huge ship. You, you, you could just imagine. It was, a, it was a whole other type of life than city life. Yeah. And it was on this open expanse of water, which was very peaceful. But it was a busy, interesting place. That's the Muppets Take Manhattan. Okay, now, two, 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 that's perfect. Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal. Um, we, it was hard to conceive how we could do Dark Crystal because everything in the movie was made by our workshop or the set yeah. people. There were only, I don't know, maybe three or four shots that, were, that included the outside world. And they were very minor in the picture. So basically, it was a, creating a whole environment. And the characters were very complex. A Skeksis uh, was operated by two people inside, and four people under the set, which was two feet off the floor, duck walking along behind us, each working a lever. So, you know, one person was doing a sneer. Another person was doing eyes open and shut. Another one was going left and right. Another one was raising hackles on the character. Mm -hmm. And we can't talk to each other because they're under the floor and they can't hear me and I can't hear them. So we had to pass it along through intermediaries. Say so when we get you know just after I turn and look at the other guy, then we'll we'll rear up, and uh, everything had to be done by the letter, you know, by word cues and action cues, and it was very complex. The only way we could communicate was each of us had a hearing aid that had been modified to be a radio receiver, so that we could hear Jim and Frank give direction, 
And then we had to somehow transmit it to our people down below. Oh so gosh. it was ambitious, and we all knew that. And I remember always thinking, Jim's ambition. He's so ambitious. He's so optimistic that, that anything is possible. Yeah. The first day we were shooting, the Skeksis were filing by the dying emperor, who was Jim's character, on a, on, on a big, ornate bed. And all the Skeksis were, they were conniving guys who all wanted to get the, the job after he died. And they were just filing around. So to do that, the performers of the Skeksis were on a two-foot-high track. It's like a wooden floor that was literally wide enough for two people to walk on. And it was pitch dark. And, of course, inside our costumes it was black, except we had a monitor. So we could see a little image that was three inches square of the scene. The very first take, we're walking along, and my foot landed on thin air. And we started to fall off the, off the path that we were on. And there was a guy in there with me. I, I, I have to look up his name. I can't remember it. He, he was a Turkish guy. He was just a great guy. He's in there with me, and we're going. And somebody caught us. There was a stagehand or somebody there who caught us wow. and put us back in position. And I looked at the guy next to me, and I said, this time, Jim's optimism may have gotten the best of him. We were supposed to be there 18 or 20 weeks to shoot it, and I thought, we'll never get this shot. Two weeks later, we were ad-libbing. Oh, really? Oh, sure. But imagine trying to do it with your crew underneath the floor. <laughs> I know. The rest of your character you can't even talk to. Those people down there, they knew what to do with their lever, and they could feel where the performer was going. The guy in the suit could feel where I was going. You know, you do this all the yeah. time on, yeah. with, with, uh, with an, a, a right-hand person, you know? A good right-hand person, and that's a big deal to be a good right-hand person, yeah. is intuitive, and they somehow pick up on the energy and the flow of what the main performer is doing. So we were able to literally do that with these cumbersome puppets. You know, I once again had to think, well, Jim knows what he's talking about. I do not. <laughs> uh, and then you worked on Dark Crystal Age of the Resistance. How did that feel going back to that world? Well, I was in awe of what Lisa and everybody had done. You know, Brian and Wendy designed the characters. Their son was head of the workshop, Toby, who, yeah. well, your listeners will know that Toby was the baby in Labyrinth. But uh, they created a beautiful, beautiful sets. They had a, an, they'd taken over an, an industrial concern, you know, a former industrial concern. So they had mm. huge workshops, huge sets, two big stages, it really, it really was fitting. The scale of the production and the quality of it was fitting. It went on from where Dark Crystal had stopped in terms of illuminating characters and what was going on in that world. It was a sort of a prehistory of, of the Dark Crystal. And they enlarged the world hugely, but also deepened it, you know. And they were all performed with a lot of depth and a lot of knowledge about the species and the world that we didn't have before. And it looks authentically of that world, of the Dark Crystal, even though it's it shot slightly differently, a little more handheld yeah. feel to it. It had a much more spontaneous feel, and, and the uh, director and cinematographer on that were stunning. They operated the cameras. Unbelievable. <laughs> and they would pick up the cameras and start climbing and crawling around on that set. And yeah. that, offered, that offered some resistance because the terrain wasn't always level, and they were just working on these weird conditions getting shots. It was superhuman what those guys did. Yeah. And um, I said to Lisa while I was still there shooting I, that Jim would be incredibly proud of her for taking that world and deepening it and in expanding upon it. He would be so proud. Stepping away from my talk with Dave Goals for a few minutes to listen to a Jerry song. This song is called Be Positive, and it's a demo of the song that ended up on Jerry's album, Truro Daydreams. Jerry? I once knew a boy, his name was Roy He always had a long face He'd sit around inside, never really try Oh my, what a sad, sad disgrace Be positive, try positive Lose that frown where a smile ought to be Your life you can change it, you can rearrange it Just be positive and you will see Negativity will make you go slow Follow you around wherever you go 
to keep you down, make your head hang low. Take my word, my friend, you do not want to know. Be positive, try positive. This did a great man once say, hey, hey, hey. To shorten your journey, you must take the first step. It is the only way. Hold your head up high, it's the positive thing. It will help you feel good, it will make your soul sing. It will take you up to the best you can be. It will make your bell ring. It will set you free. Be positive, try positive. One thing at a time gets it done. Whoa, 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 when you're positively positive. Positively, you'll have positive fun. Do it now. Positively, have positive fun. Make a plan. Positively, have positive fun. Say I can. Thank you, Jerry. One, two, three, four. Go, 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 go. Be loud, we are back with Dave Goals. Uh, Fraggle Rock. I know that's a, a show that's near and dear to your heart. Yeah, transformational, really. Getting to work in Canada, being, being immersed in that culture. It was, it's a lovely place. People are salt of the earth. You know, Canada always makes me think, well, we should all try to be more like Canadians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, might, that couldn't hurt. Yeah, and... and was that the show? Correct me if I'm wrong. Did did Jim say it was a it was going to bring peace to the world? Well, this came up at the end of the the Muppet Show and Dark Crystal, mm-hmm. and Jim was always thinking ahead to other things that he wanted to do. And he called a meeting. I wasn't at the meeting. I was busy shooting. But he called a meeting of uh, producers, writers, other people in the company, and said, "I'd like to do a show that stops war." And, you know, Jim was no fool. He knew that uh, that, that wasn't uh, likely, but he thought it was worth trying. Yeah. And I remember getting to Toronto and starting on the show and being conscious that we had to be examples for children. Um, I was frustrated that we had to be good. So we have to. It's a, we have to be so goody goody now. It can't be an- anarchic like the Muppet Show was. You know, the Muppet Show right. was crazy. We didn't do anything that would be censored, but you know, there was a lot of freedom there. But here, you can't you can't model something that kids are liable to copy and, and hurt them. Right. And I just I was frustrated at first, and then I gradually just became convinced of the world and entered it fully, and it became kind of like a psychodrama for life. I just thought. Yeah, it was formative for me. It had it had an impact on me. Well, and if you're going to make a show about ending war, the kids have to learn. You're not going to teach adults. Yeah. You know, it's a, certainly a noble idea. It it definitely is a noble idea. And somehow, I, I wish that our species could take it to heart and really get it before something bad happens. I know, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so it was it was a joy to be a part of. Yeah. And you were you were also on the Fraggle Rock, Back to the Rock on Apple TV Plus. I was. Now, <laughs> <laughs> what's it like to return to the world of the Fraggles after all this time? Well, first of all, I was really happy to be invited, and I'm still grateful to be involved with it because it's one of the most important things I've ever worked on. I think, to me anyway, mm-hmm. the creative team that was put together was right on the same page. These were. People, almost everybody, was raised by Fraggle Rock, and they love it from childhood. And they were highly respectful from the get-go of what the show was trying to do. So working on it was an honor. I was a co-EP, so we worked on everything from the conceptual stages of which characters were going to be in the show to what each episode was about. We reviewed every draft of every script. We reviewed every puppet every costume, every hairdo. Um, We were involved with all of it. And what I will say is that Lisa turned out to be an incredible leader. I hadn't worked under her on a project before, I guess, other than than Dark Crystal, you know, which was brief. But she was so good at pulling together her people. Hallie Stanford, same thing. She was the Henson executive producer along with Johnny Tartaglia. Mm Mm-hmm. Lovely people who all felt a debt to this show for their own lives, from their own lives, and 
paid the utmost respect to the show all the way through. So that was an honor and it was a privilege. And I'll tell you this, as you get older, um, because you're so young, right. as you get older, you start to, uh, you, you know, you learn things in life and you start to want to uh, express some of what you learn through your work. And sometimes if your work is locked in a certain place, it can't get deeper. It's very hard to get a project that's deeper. Fraggle is that opportunity. So I, along with everybody else, takes it very seriously, and we want to contribute. You know, it's, again, it's a chance to maybe have an effect on the world, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm feeling good about it. Um, there are always notes, even on the original, we always had differences of opinion as to whether to do this or whether to do that. Um but that's just part of collaboration, you know. Yeah, it, it just comes to so we're well within the tolerance of collaboration on this one. I think we're that's all great. really happy that it's out there, and hope that people like it. Hope that it f- is perceived as being worthwhile to proceed with. So, in the early '90s, Disney made two features with the Muppets. They made a Muppet Christmas Carol and then uh, Muppet Treasure Island. What did you like about those adaptations and how the Muppets were cast? Well, Muppet Christmas Carol is my all-time favorite Muppet movie. And Muppet Movie and Treasure Island are tied for second. So I really love those exercises. The Christmas Carol came not too long after we lost Jim. And so it was really healing to work on a piece of profound literature at that time. Uh, I still can't get through watching that with a dry eye, I can't because it's such a it's, it's such a powerful story. Do you feel Jim's presence, you know, in your uh, recollections of making it? I I don't know if I would state it that way because I always feel Jim's presence all the time. I think about him all the time, and he was such a dear friend. Um, so I think we were all guided by trying to do our best and trying to, you know, we were now working without Jim. It's the first big thing we had done. And so we were focused on trying to make something that Jim would be proud of, you know, yeah. for sure, for our friend. I-, I love it. It's something I have to watch every year. I know. It's a treasure to me, too. I watch it, too. I love it. It's great. But Michael Caine was so good. Oh my gosh, he is just brilliant. I mean, he plays it. He is serious. He's yeah. he's brilliant. So well, good. you know, he did a lot of preparation. He, he said when we did press for the film, one of the things he said was, "They said, well, how did you prepare to play Scrooge?" And he said, "I cut up my wife's credit cards." <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, he he stayed in his trailer. He was a really nice guy. Oh, he's a great guy. Yeah. I mean, and, and a genius. And he stayed in his trailer and worked with his dresser, who also ran lines with him. Mm-hmm. So when he came onto the set, he was cold stone prepared. And um, he shared with us one of his techniques, which I don't see many actors do, which is that he never blinks on camera. He feels that a blink interrupts contact with the audience. And you will never see Michael Caine blinking during a shot. And the minute you start trying to do that, your eyes burn like crazy. So this is a formidable person who managed to yes. overcome that somehow. He's, he's he is brilliant. really brilliant. Yes, and, and, and uh, it's my favorite Scrooge. Oh my God! And and it was funny because when I first heard, heard his name brought up. I thought, well, he's he's too soft. He's 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 soft. You know, he's not. An, I thought Scrooge would be angular and beaky, and skinny and yeah. you know, kind of evil. And I was really wrong uh, because he. Went there for Scrooge. He, oh yeah, he, oh, he was just so good. We could literally talk for hours about the number of shows and movies that you've done, but we don't have that kind of time. So I'm going to skip over everything, like Muppets Tonight and Dinosaurs and Christmas Toy and Muppet Family Christmas and Jim Henson Hour and Muppet Vision 3D and Animal Show and Muppets from Space and Adventures of Elmo and Grouchland, which is where I met you for the first time, Dave, and I was your. I was your. Uh, you played the that dumb chicken. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah, that's where vaguely. I first met you. I met you, and I was your assistant on Adventures in Elmo and Grouchland. Uh, anyway, the Muppets on ABC, the Muppets film, the Muppets Most Wanted, Muppets Take the Ball, and the O2, and Muppets Now, and Muppets Haunted Mansion. Any of those? Just pick one of them. <laughs> like a memory of one of any of them. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> Hollywood Bowl. And you were there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hollywood Bowl. It was flippin' hot. Oh, yeah. I had friends who were all going to meet up in the Northeast for a gathering, like a creative gathering, and I couldn't go because we had to do the Hollywood Bowl. It was, rehearsals were just sweltering oh, on that stage. Gosh. We did yeah, the show the in the evening, the day. but yeah, it, was it was torture awful. to be in those rehearsals. And then on Friday, before we opened, we had a dress rehearsal that ended just before the audience came in onto the property. <laughs> right? Yeah. Complete disaster. Nothing worked. The uh, music oh, was yeah, out of right. sync with the tracks. Uh, they forgot to hook up the monitors on the, on the Bunsen and Beaker set. Every technical snafu you could think of happened, and it was complete wreck. And then the audience walked in, and we had dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. And then, and then the show happened, and it was perfect, except I think at one point Kermit's mic was off for one word. That's all that oh, happened. Nothing. Really, right. Virtually nothing. And I, couldn't, I just couldn't believe that that could go down that way, that, it, that the rehearsal was so terrible and such a mess. Yes. And it was audacious to try to do. Yeah, why are you know, we doing I used to this? go to the Hollywood Bowl when I was a kid. <laughs> when I was in high school and college, I would take girls to the Hollywood Bowl to see Andre Previn or Tony Bennett or somebody. Yeah. And I would get seats that were like halfway back or two thirds of the way back. And literally, a human being on that stage was at the most looked like a quarter of an inch tall. It was oh, yeah. just a little. Not even a stick figure, just this tiny little thing, hoping that they're wearing a white tuxedo or something, a white dinner jacket, so that you can see which one you're listening to. Yeah. Okay, so now we're doing it, and we're doing characters that are 18 inches tall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was audacious yes. to even try it. We did thank have a few the, screens. Yeah, thank goodness for those screens on the side. Well, and they were moderate. They were moderate screens. They weren't big screens or anything, and they right. weren't a lot of them, but... Um, to, to put on, you know, it's always something that Jim would do, really. You know, you think about it. Let's do a puppet show at this venue that has a huge audience that yeah. goes back a quarter mile. 18,000 people. Let's just go. Let's do a puppet show for them. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you another startling thing that happened to me, and, and uh, I don't know if you, you guys probably all have your own versions of it, but um, there was a moment where Gonzo had to talk to the audience a little bit and then Bobby Moynihan was going to come on and they were going to present an act. <laughs> and because Gonzo was talking to Bobby, Bobby was going to be standing on the floor, so I had to be on a rolly, which is this low thing that, that you roll around with your legs. I know this. And I remember I rolling know, I know that. You know I, you were telling me? Were you, no, no, but were you telling me what a rolly is? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Well, you, it's you just did you, it. Keep, <laughs> you keep asking. Anyway, <laughs> I get on this rolly to go out. And, and they turned on the house lights, and I'm, on, I'm literally down on the floor, rolling along like a spider on my back, with Gonzo up in the air, and he talks to the audience a little bit and asks a few questions of them that were scripted. And I was, of course, perceiving this on the monitor, watching my character, but I was also looking up at the audience. I was seeing where I used to sit up there, yeah, way up there, two-thirds of the way back. And it felt like... Everybody had come over to the house, and I was just in my living room, and everybody was gathered around, and I had Gonzo talk to them, yeah. which has hardly ever happened, but it felt like that. It felt like we, we had 18,000 friends over, and I don't know what I was expecting, but I didn't expect it to feel like home, but it felt like home. We were home with our, with our audience, with our people. And, and you don't love yeah. to do live appearances that much, do you? I don't like it. I like to try to do a good performance instead <laughs> with multiple takes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mentioned Muppets Most Wanted, and I want to... Uh, somebody has left you a little message, Dave. Hello, my darling friend, Dave. I wish I was there with you. One of my happiest memories of all my Muppet memories and there are many happy ones is sitting with you on Muppets Most Wanted in the Muppet Orchestra with puppets that were just showing the tips of their heads and laughing all day long really uncomfortable positions we weren't doing anything major but I just thought I love my job so much I am with like-minded people well, a like-minded person, you. We are laughing. We are talking about things we care about and that mean things. And I just, it gave me such joy to spend that time with you. And I love you so much. I'm so glad you're in my life and have been in my life for 
quite a long time now. Bye. Wow, Louise Gold. Um, well, all those feelings are mutual. I mean, I say this to you guys. That, that I think of you as the new guys who are doing Muppet characters now. That every job seems to me like a reunion. I, I literally, I hate to say it to you, Matt, but I love working with you. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just not part of our normal discourse. No, it's not. No, but I love it. And that's the thing that means the most. I love getting together with you and the shop people, Peter, you know, Jane. Yeah. Well, it's just too many to even list. There's so many people who work in New Jersey who show up for our various shoots, and I, and I never know who's coming, and I'm always happy when I see them. Chance to catch up. It's just uh, because, you know, this all goes back to what Jim did. He was a sort of a Pied Piper. He was walking along playing his flute, and you could, you know, if you were lucky enough to be invited to follow along, you got to be with all these other people who are following along. And he, he found remarkable people, and they were characters. They weren't homogenous. You know, I mean, I once had, <laughs> I once had an old girlfriend uh, visit me in uh, Silicon Valley. We went to visit the place where I used to work in, in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, it's all beige in there. It's an it's a electronics firm. Everything's beige. Uh, there are partitions. You work in your cubicle. You have a little desk. Everybody else has the same desk. <laughs> right, yeah. Anyway, we walked out, and I said, so what did you think of that, Annie? And, and she said, communism. <laughs> <laughs> because there was, there was a sort of a prevailing aesthetic there. <laughs> Not only of the place, but of the people, too. There, you know, there were lots of characters working there that I always sought out. But the overall decorum was pretty, pretty constrained. Yeah. And Jim did not do that. He hired all sorts of characters who were real characters in their own right. And they all had something that nobody else could do. They could all do something unique. And it was part of my education about celebrating diversity. It was an early stage of that. When I first joined Muppets, I thought, wow, these people are really outspoken. It's a little scary. You know, just in the workshop, you know, they, they, had, they had really strong opinions about everything, and I was kind of afraid of some of them. <laughs> but over time, I realized, and, and yeah, I guess I thought, well, gee, Jim, these people, some of these people might not even be employable in the rest of the world. Uh, only here, where Jim <laughs> tolerates the, yeah. their craziness. <laughs> and then slowly I realized, oh, each one of them is a part of this whole thing, and they make it better. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty remarkable what Jim was able to do. Yeah, and the same thing applies to, to us. You know, we've worked in other countries, mm -hmm. and we get there, and some of the work practices are different. The cultures are different. At first, you think, what's wrong with these people? And then you realize, oh, they're just people, and their culture is different, but they're still just people, and they have something to offer. And I think that's the big message about the world that I took from Jim. The big, big one was, what are we fighting about? You know? Yeah. We, if, we, if we engage in a common exercise together, we will find things that we love about each other. And if only we could all be aware of that. If only yeah. everybody could have that thought. Well, part of that is just being together, you know, like not being on this side of the fence and you're over there. Mm -hmm. Let's do things together. Let's learn who each other are. I'm sorry, I'm just preaching now. Sorry. No, that's, that's fine. There was something that you mentioned about a reunion that, I, that, that just popped into my head just now is... is I've heard you say before that one of your one of the reasons why you do what you do is so that we can go out to dinner, so that we can uh, sit and chat, so that <laughs> yes. we can have those moments together. I mean, and I mean that genuinely. Like that's the important thing to you. It sounds like is the experience of uh, oh, yeah. communing with somebody, yeah, uh, people. I love it. I just adore it. And if you read the new book about Fraggle Rock that came out recently, uh, you'll hear Jerry Jewell talking a lot about. Um, we all we all got together a lot and over you, all, almost always over food, <laughs> yeah. and it was a big part of the, the Muppet culture. We would always have a meal. Like Jim would have a meeting, but there would be food. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Jerry and Susan and I would go out to dinner all the time, and it was indistinguishable. Life was indistinguishable from art, and that's what that what Jim. That's, I got myself so worked up. That's what Jim's life was an example of. He didn't seem to have outside friends. He worked with his friends. 
I mean, I know he had a few friends from on the outside from before, but it wasn't like he had new regular friends from the outside. He was completely engrossed in work, and his friends were the ones he worked with. Yeah. So he would, you know, he, I don't think Jim cooked when he was in London by himself, so he would ask somebody out to dinner, you know. He would say, hey, you want to have a bite tonight? And, you know, it was always fun to do that. Okay. Nobody ever said no, because it was fun to be with Jim. I just came across some videos yesterday. I, I recently had all of our home videos um, digitized. And um, I, I happened to last night be looking at footage of a time when Jim, he, he took a little group of us, like seven or eight people, out on the Mediterranean on a yacht. It was like a 110-foot, super modern, incredible, streamlined yacht. Beautiful ship with a crew of, I, I'm going to say, four, five people maybe, who became friends during the crew. And we had such an amazing time. And I found some video that I had just been shooting, of goofing around on shipboard. And at one point I, I invented this thing called the intrusive camera, where the camera would be videoing you and it would come up and shoot your eye right it would just get really too close yes and so i was doing that to jim and he was laughing and i did it to other people on the on the boat and the the close the story though was that we really we had a lovely time just being together and it it was just before a tv series but it wasn't really about the tv series we didn't do any any real work out there we were just enjoying ourselves and uh later on when jim died we were we all gathered in New York at the office, and really, we just told stories and cried for a week because we couldn't believe this happened to Jim because he was so he seemed so indestructible. He seemed so vulnerable looking, but indestructible. But anyway, during the, that first day, we had a ship to shore call from the crew of that of that boat that we that Jim chartered for us, and they were broken up. They they had said to us. You were the best customers we ever had. And it was because we were nice to them. We we just hung out with them and had a good time. And uh, and they were just, they were out in the middle of the Atlantic when this happened and they made a point of calling wow. and getting to the office to tell them how they felt. That shows how far Jim's reach was. How yeah. he really did affect people. Oh, there was just something there about him. that was, uh, Jerry Jewell used the term that Jim had a whim of steel. And it's, you'll never get a better uh, description of Jim than that because he was unrelenting in his desire to do great things. And yet, he just did it in such a relaxed, fun way. <laughs> That's why we all followed That's, along. We all wanted to be yeah. part of it. We all wanted to hang out together. Whenever you tell a story about him, I'm, I'm, I love hearing these stories oh. about, about these days and these times. What great memories. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. And that's why, I think that's why, to me, my life feels epic, that I've had these people in my life. And that includes you and Peter Linz and David Rudman and uh, not Bill Beretta so much, but <laughs> Jane Gutnick, uh, <laughs> all these people in the shop that I just love. You know, it's yeah. been a huge, epic <laughs> blessing for me. And, 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 you know, Fraggle Rock led to having children. For me, and that was never going to happen. And somehow it transformed. It, it, well, it, it triggered me into transforming. Yeah. Uh, and that, of course, has been the greatest thing of all: having children. Tip to listeners: if you just have a job that you think is ordinary, you could still have children, and that's a whole other galaxy. That's a whole other galaxy in life that surpasses anything else. I think. Yeah. Okay, Dave, we are nearing the end of this interview. But you I want to try a, that again? I, I, I think did, better, I did it, I did it, I yeah, did it. I did it started, you, you just cracked up during it. You might as well, you, you probably want a good one, right? Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Okay, Dave, so, oh, no, you've talked over me again. De oh, I, I think I'll it was just, the delay on, on this. It might be, yeah, this. I don't know how it'll line yeah. up. Anyway, we're near the end of the interview, and I, I, and I have these rapid-fire questions that I'm going to ask you. I'm not a rapid-fire person, but I'll try. You don't have to be rapid-fire. I'm going to be rapid-fire. See, and I, I have and to I probably edit myself. Won't. No, no, don't I'm not going to say, yourself. there are things I might say that I wouldn't even oh. want you to hear. <laughs> yeah, don't say those things. So I can't go top speed. I have to, th I have to oh, think yeah. and consider, can Fair I enough. trust Matt with this? It, yes. you know, what if I want him to cut it out? Will he cut it out or will he sell it after I die? <laughs> what is he going to do? Because I don't know you that well. I know you oh. pretty well. Yeah. 
I, but, you, I, you, you can trust me. This is, these are easy questions. All right, here we go. What's mm-hmm. the hardest part about being a puppeteer? Pain. What's the easiest? Massages. <laughs> okay. What is your biggest strength as a Muppet performer? Pain. Wait, now what? What do you mean? Well, I thought you wanted rapid fire. Well, you no, but to... you can, but is that a real answer? Your biggest I have to strength elaborate? is pain? Yes. What does that mean? I understand pain. That's your biggest strength as a Muppet performer is you understand pain? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. What is your biggest weakness as a Muppet performer? Um, I'm still trying to... I'm still trying to get good, but I, I, I don't know if I'll make it. <laughs> oh my God. All right. What is one of your favorite things about being a Muppet performer? Uh, the people, really. It's, I was going to say catering, but probably <laughs> a little above that is people. <laughs> good. Uh, if you were not a Muppet performer, what would be your career? Caterer. No, I don't know what I would be. No, it would, I, I don't know. It might be I a design. I, lo- I mean, I would see design as a part of my life, always. I, this was a godsend, honestly. I didn't. I remember when I was back in Silicon Valley. I did not have an idea. I didn't. Yeah. I I thought, well, there must be something more than this, but I didn't have a vision of it until yeah. I saw the Muppets, and then that became what I wanted. I don't know what I would do. I really don't. I, it, I don't it, it's making me anxious, Matt. No, no, don't don't be anxious because you are. Little, you don't have to worry. What if it what what hadn't about. happened? No, but it uh, did. Where would I be? I wouldn't. I wouldn't have these kids. <laughs> I wouldn't have Debbie. <laughs> You have all of it, though. This is it's okay. I'm bringing you back to now. Here, okay, I have one I'm last just, question. <laughs> I'm just I'm scared to think about that. <laughs> one last question for you, Dave. Okay, okay. See if you can answer it. Uh, maybe. Our friend Jerry Nelson once said to me, uh, "Sesame Street is great, but you should always have something that is your own, that you create, that comes from you." So, Dave Goals, what is that for you? Oh, well, I'm always creating things. I, uh, first of all, I have a, w- a workshop, so I make things. But I'll give you an example, because I make things all the time. I'm always involved in a project uh, of some sort. Sometimes it's things like getting a backup generator installed at our house, but other times it's purely creative. So COVID hit, <clears throat> and I thought, you know what? I have a router in my wood shop, and I don't really know how to use it. So I will come up with a project that requires the router, and I will learn how to use it. And luckily, you can learn how to do anything, including brain surgery, because it's all on YouTube. So <laughs> right. during that year, I made two window beds for our dogs. For our dog. We have only one dog. He has two, two window beds. Two beds. Two beds, one yeah. dog. We buy these little beds for him. They have a pillow all around the outside. You probably have these. And, and a cushion in the middle. And he can lie there and put his head on the pillow. And, and he likes his beds. We had two of them. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought, but wouldn't it be great if he could see outside from his bed? You know, we have a craftsman house, and I did not want to. I didn't want to build something out of two by fours and have an ugly thing in the house. So I thought I'll try to make it fine furniture. So I chose the craftsman genre as as exercised a hundred years ago by um, Green and Green. They were the designers of the the grand craftsman bungalows, and they had a beautiful style of architecture for the furniture that they also designed for these bungalows. The furniture is built by the Hall brothers. And this in, involves details like square ebony pegs covering up where a screw was embedded. Okay. And cloud lifts, you know, which is from Asian art. Uh, the edge of a piece of furniture, instead of being straight, uh-huh. might have a little lift to it or a little depression and then back up to the original level. It's hard to describe on sound only, but I guess the budget here doesn't permit visual aids. Anyway, I thought, I will design something that is of that ilk, and I will build it. And so I did, and it took me close to a year to do these two beds, but they're in the house now, and I'm satisfied every time I look at them because they're part of our life. And they're something that our kids can take to their houses and if their house has lower windows, they can cut off the legs to make them shorter. Right. <laughs> if it has if, taller windows, that's another problem. Yeah, if they have a dog. Well, it would work for a cat. But oh. it's, a, it's, a, it's a bed that's up at that level, and then it has one or two steps so the dog can get up there. And it's all designed as furniture, and it fits into our house, fits in with the other furniture. So that's an example of something that I might take on. I usually take on things that I don't know how to do. I love that. Right? Well, Dave Goals, 
I, I, we joke a lot, but I, I really am how lucky I am to know you. And I'm, I'm, I thank you so much for talking to me today. It means a lot to me. Am I supposed to serious? Do you want me to say, do a serious say, response? You don't have to say anything. You can say whatever you want to say. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter. You're so cute. You are so cute. <laughs> Look uh, at you. I love you, Dave. I'll see you next time. I love you too. Take care, pal. Well, that's it. That's season two of Below the Frame. I really hope you enjoyed this season. You know, I I had a lot of fun bringing it to you, and I am going to continue to post new stuff every once in a while, so keep an eye out for that, and maybe we'll be back with season three before you know it. Get updates and stuff about Below the Frame and Muppets and Sesame Street and the Mighty Weaklings and pretty much anything I feel like posting, usually dogs, on my Instagram, my Twitter, my Facebook, my TikTok accounts, all at Welcome Matt V. Below the Frame is produced by me, Matt Vogel. The theme song was written by Stephanie DeBruzzo and performed by my band, The Mighty Weaklings. The podcast artwork was created by Dave Holtine at DaveHoltineDesign.com. Special thanks to Jan Nelson for giving me Jerry's stories and to Peter Linz for sharing a memory and reading a story by Mr. Nelson. Thanks to Dave Goals and Louise Gold for being a part of this episode. And thanks to you, the fans, for listening. I am Matt Vogel. We'll see you next time when we go Below the Frame. If you want to be in the know About how we put together our little show If you'd like to hear the puppa cheers And play the characters that you cheer Then go, go, go below the frame If you got to find out how we do it And how we put our bodies physically through it If you demand to learn about the secrets Here's another line